I wait for you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us here uh, in this strange virtual world so that we can have a few moments to really enjoy the scholarship that we associate with universities like the University of Hawaii. My name is Miriam Stark, and I'm currently the director for the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Hawaii. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Blundell. He received a doctorate in anthropology from the University of California, Los Angeles, what we call UCLA, based on the life histories of Buddhist practitioners making their own ethnographic films in Sri Lanka. Professor Blundell is the founder and co-director of the Asia Pacific Spatiotemporal Institute, top university project in digital humanities, and the founding professor of the Digital Humanities Group of the Research Center for Chinese Cultural Subjectivity in Taiwan at National Chengchi University. Um, to say this about Dr. Blundell is really to minimize the deep experience he has uh, teaching in Taiwan and researching Austronesia for much of the last several decades. He's currently affiliated with the UCLA Center for Southeast Asian Studies and teaches at UCLA. And he conducts research with the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative through the University of California, Berkeley as an anthropology and language editor. He also serves as the honorary professor for the Center for Austronesian Studies at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston, the United Kingdom. As a filmmaker, he received the United Nations Day of Isak 2014 award for the best documentary, A Rising Light, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar and the Birth of a New Era in India. Dr. Blundell's research and publication concern both South and Southeast Asia, the anthropology of religion, Buddhism, visual anthropology, archeology, span aesthetic anthropology and geographic information systems mapping languages and cultures. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Blundell today when he will speak with us about interconnectivity of Southeast Asia visualized through historical GIS mapping. Take it away, Dr. Blundell. Okay. Uh, aloha everyone. And I would like to give my mahalo to Professor um, Miriam Stark for inviting me to share uh, my research and uh, Sarah for the outreach coordination in setting up this talk and especially for um, people uh, helping with the technical issues including Ariel and uh, Salvinian and uh, Liana. Uh, all of the, the staff at uh, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies have been a great help to set up uh, this seminar talk for uh, this afternoon. So I began my interests in maritime navigation uh, when I was 24. I sailed um, with a Brahmin priest from the Trincomalee Harbor in Sri Lanka to Singapore. And it inspired me to understand how uh, Indic religious networks uh, spread through navigation. I am a, a Sri Lanka specialist who studied at the Peridinia University and at Damasat in Thailand. And then somehow I found myself uh, teaching anthropology in Taiwan. And then about 25 years ago, I became interested in Austronesian studies and I began uh, connecting Austronesian navigation with Indic religious transmissions through trade. And that is what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, we'll go to the next. There we go. So my presentation illustrates ways to facilitate configuring historical data with geospatial tools, featuring my Southeast Asian research utilizing geographic information systems, point locations of ancient trade routes and religious sites of the region linked to enrich spatial information.
it not only questions how we can understand issues of identity and traditions in a rapidly changing globalized cultural landscape, but also how we can experience local culture and geography through malleable, immersive, nonlinear mosaic narrative. Historically, mutual traits are observed in legends, beliefs, architecture, songs, motifs, symbols, ocean craft, and voyaging techniques. And of course, through language transferred as aesthetic systems across vast distances of space and time. These traits have been transferred, I want to emphasize, as aesthetic systems. And the language uh, of verbal communication and written text was maintained across these ocean voyaging of Austronesian transportation systems through uh, early history and, and across vast distances. The project interacts with various research fields and integrates many different types of data and styles, developing enhanced research methodologies that have possibilities of creating paradigm shifts and multi-vocal views in the humanities and social sciences. Research has found that estuary seaports are oriented with mountain peaks serving as navigational reference points. That I will illustrate in this talk. 3D mapping has provided new guidance for developing best practice standards applied to databases giving interactive multimedia utility aspects. This allows uniting the context of environmental landscapes with cultural data for making new enhanced possibilities for spatial humanities for scholarly results. My present study began in 2016 as I was a visiting researcher at the East West Center and received a grant from the Taiwan Ministry of Science and Technology and Digital Humanities to discover the furthest extent of Buddhism transported by Austronesian navigation. The research goal was to locate those historical trade routes and ports in Southeast Asia. I want to give my appreciation and thanks to our librarian of Southeast Asian studies, Yati and uh, the Indonesian Map Library at Hamilton at the University of Hawaii. What is the worth and value of heritage connections? We find uh, peoples have separate yet related traditions that include palm leaf and rattan weaving, pottery, metalwork, jewelry, batik, constructing ships, wood and stone carving and other innumerable crafts for domestic utility and for trade. Our research illustrates a range of ways to facilitate configuring social science data with geospatial tools featuring monsoon Asia research with GIS point locations. This includes migration and historical trade routes, religious sites, and how the region is linked to enrich attribute spatial information. So examples of spatial humanities tools, the use of Google Earth, this is one of the, uh, the most convenient tools to, to map, okay. And what are we mapping? We're looking at uh, maritime sites. Uh, along, this happens to be uh, off the coast of Sri Lanka in terms of the archaeological uh, aspect of uh, finding where ships have sunk uh, off ports. This happened to be a ship that carried iron ore from 
the Mediterranean to China and sank there off the coast of Sri Lanka. Observing uh, virtual reality in exhibition space. Use of 360 surround immersive. So visitors are placed in surrounding 360 degree camera viewing within compositions, thus giving the viewer perspective within the action of each scene and interacting with the scene. This uh, platform is uh, thus activates viewer participation and allows one to engage the subject matter in a unique individualized experience of people in place. So this is an example of a, of a LIDAR survey by remote sensing. Uh, this happens to be Angkor Wat that shows the surface and uh, below the surface, uh, what LIDAR can see in terms of the site. Time enabled map displays. This is, uh, we give examples uh, based on historical linguistics and that enables displays of multiple language area boundaries, including contemporary language areas. It uses dynamic map display techniques capable of visualizing and showing language change over time. We use uh, map overlays. Uh, this is again based on Google Earth and we feature in uh, historical maps and uh, how they're overlaid and put into a composite to show in this case uh, the trade routes from the time of the Chola Empire. Use of early maps. Uh, we have an extensive map collection uh, with, uh, and also I have been using uh, maps at Hamilton Library in their collection uh, for understanding, uh, especially Indonesia. So one of the important traits of the research is about the monsoon. So <laughs> important by season for sailing across the seas, uh, made the trade predictable and profitable in accordance with winds and annual shift of direction that marked the trade calendar for ocean shipments. So this is an example the monsoon Asia wind patterns. You can see through the, the Bay of Bengal, the, the, the wind shifts from uh, uh, winter to autumn, late summer, and they have uh, currents of winds that are traveling through the Bay of Bengal and then through the South China Sea, uh, up through the east coast of China, Taiwan, and back down through uh, the Champa or Cambodian region. So we uh, instituted at about the same time around 2015, uh, the Asia Pacific Spatial Temporal Institute that helps with new methods of integrating primary source materials into interactive visualizations. And this is for uh, facilitating capacity building and innovative ways of sharing information by digital methods for visualizing spatial temporal aspects of human experience. So if you uh, can play this, this is a, a one minute that shows the Institute's capacity. Where it's located in the campus.
So monsoon Asia is our region, uh, especially uh, where the winds have brought uh, navigators across the seas. So why not bring out the historical story with digital humanities tools to circulate among people of all walks of life of all ages. So later at the end of this uh, talk, I will give an example of that, how this could entertain and explore the data with the public to find new possibilities and understanding history from the grassroots and people can learn by themselves with a range of apps that are handheld and not to be told from the top down. So we're finding linkages with ships and navigational routes and how, how those routes are having timelines, seasonal trade winds, river estuary ports, voyaging with merchants and monks, early historical stories and archeological sites. The research question is to what extent the religious systems and related motifs and symbols spread across networks of monsoon and Indo-Pacific regions. Did this occur in part through Austronesian voyaging? So I attended a, an Austronesian conference in Indonesia, and this is one of the, their uh, illustrations at the conference that showed uh, how Austronesian navigation uh, came out of Taiwan about 3,500 years ago, after the language had been incubating in Taiwan from about 6,000 years ago. And and incubated again through the Philippines, Sulawesi, and Sumatra. Merchants and monks commissioned Austronesian speakers, I believe, uh, as navigators to sell in their sea craft wood, plank, hull, lashed, and stitched together with outrigger across the Bay of Bengal, Andaman Sea, and the Indian Ocean. So navigation is the key to understanding the research. And this is a mural that was uh, done in the Batanas Islands in the Philippines uh, to show how navigators sailed out with uh, their sails were made of uh, banana leaf fiber and they would sail out into the, the Pacific. And some of the voyaging went as their uh, legends uh, were into the sun, the rise of the sun uh, to the horizon, looking for other islands. We invite researchers to share an expansive data in layers of time across space, providing new tools to advance humanistic inquiry. So uh, as in my introduction, uh, I am uh, part of what is the international uh, uh, consortium of the Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative directed um, as I do the Austronesian team uh, help with uh, the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. And this help has been inspired uh, for more than 20 years by uh, Professor Lewis Lancaster, who has initiated digital text and GIS cultural atlas project platforms for researchers. So this is based at UC Berkeley Research Lab. So um, Professor Lancaster, he is a, a Buddhist uh, scholar, especially of Tang Dynasty China and uh, and for many years, he thought that Buddhism arrived through the Silk Road, uh, but he couldn't figure out how so few Roman coins were ever found in China. And there must have been some other trade or connections 
that transmitted Buddhism. So we got to South India for a conference and met the Dailan, professor of um, the, and director for the archeological survey of India. And he was shown how uh, Buddhist sites, locations, harbors, and he, he discovered hordes of Roman coins and thought this is the way Buddhism actually was transmitted more so than the land route, there was the, the maritime route. So he created a project for maritime Buddhism. And with this project, there is the Atlas. And the Atlas shows these research sites uh, that we have uh, explored uh, in the, the coasts and areas of uh, South India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, uh, and Vietnam with the Champa, and all the way up along the coast of China uh, through uh, Japan and Korea. So these are some of the ports that we have explored and researched in the project. As I um, began my studies in Sri Lanka, uh, there was a map there, an old map, an ancient map, and it shows on the east coast of Sri Lanka, uh, the harbor of Trincomalee. And, and I found when I was a doing my research there at the age of 22. Uh, we climbed a mountain and we were told that when we got to the top of the mountain, this mountain served as a peak uh, for the Burmese boats coming from Southeast Asia, especially Thailand as well. When they wanted to come into this, um, the port of Trincomalee, they would be guided by a, a mountain by the name of La Kegala and it was providing entrance into the port. Uh, before they could see the island or the, or the coast of, the, of Sri Lanka, they would be able to see the peak of La Kaigana, and that was their navigational point. So I started actually to think about this a long time ago, uh, but it wasn't until I had the capacity of using GIS and mapping and, and making coordinates of uh, navigational routes that I was able to, to actually create a map or an atlas uh, showing that. So we'll go to the next. And this is uh, the port of Gaul, Gaul Harbor, the ancient port of Gaul. And this shows, um, uh, this is uh, the emissary of Ashoka, Sangamati, she's coming to deliver the bow tree by ship uh, from India to Sri Lanka. And this shows the legacy of the mound, how, how Neolithic mounds and uh, dolans of or uh, Menar uh, standing stones became uh, either the, the, the bound to the stupa or became a Buddhist site. We're mapping uh, Fa Xian's route and he was an early uh, uh, Chinese traveler. He did the land route of the Silk Road and then he went down through India and got into a cave in Sri Lanka where he spent a couple of years. And uh, then he, he took a voyage to um, Southeast Asia through Indonesia, where he had a shipwreck, and finally got back to Nanjing, where he wrote his memoir. And this is a very good example of, uh, of how uh, uh, travel and text can be used uh, in terms of creating an atlas. So I'm uh, in particular interest of his return voyage through Southeast Asia and where he stopped uh, and how the wind directions were able to 
uh, carry him back to the east coast of China. I'm interested in uh, mountain peaks. This happens to be in Sri Lanka, Sri Pada, and it's, uh, it's one of the holy shrines. This is an example of a megalith. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And so the natural, you might say megalith is like Mount Meru in the Hindu context. And then here's showing the Buddha uh, leaving his footprint on the top of Sri Pada. And then we come to uh, Angkor Wat showing another kind of megalith. Uh, in architecture. So this shows Meru um, as like a stepped pyramid and the lotus. So we have mountains and lotus and flora and, uh, and water systems. So here we can see this, the sun, its location to the mountain, the flora, resplendent and flowing water. Now, these are all these uh, elements that we find uh, that are being transmitted uh, through uh, the, the channels of uh, religious networks. So this is another uh, atlas showing uh, uh, historical navigational routes and where they went. And so we're using these historical maps for the sailing routes. And through Malacca, and as I mentioned, uh, my first navigation was through the Malacca Straits with uh, a Brahmin priest. And so we wanted to uh, know more about how navigation went through these routes and especially through using again historical maps. This is another example and uh, now we're going to come to uh, one of my research sites. It's on the Malay Peninsula and uh, Kada. And it's known as Bujang Valley. And it has uh, Taima related archaeological sites from the second to 13th century. So this is uh, Mount Jarai, a navigational marker to the Bujang port. And this is um, at the Bujang Museum. They have a, a diorama that shows uh, navigation into the estuary. And uh, once, once up through the estuary, you can see uh, this is a map that shows uh, the uh, Indic religious sites. and the traders uh, along the coast there. So they were Chinese, they were Arabic, they were uh, from India. Uh, Paul Wheatley had made a map uh, in 1961 showing actually uh, layers of time, a time map as a composite of the, the Murbok River estuary. So the Merbo estuary was important uh, and it's there today and, and many of the, the wharfs and the piers and the religious sites are there in situ in this valley. So you can see at the Bujang Museum, it's the only archaeological uh, museum in Malaysia and it's based on Indic cultures that were transmitted uh, uh, through navigation of the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and, and you can see shipments of 
materials from South India, east coast of India, and Indonesia. So this is a bronze Buddha. So these are dating from about uh, second to fifth century. This happens to be uh, a stone work from Bower Budur in Java that was somehow transported to Bujang Valley. And we find these uh, vessels uh, that are very much uh, part of the tra transformation from, from Neolithic pots to uh, early history. And this is uh, an inscription uh, of uh, the first inscription that I read there that shows uh, the voyage of Buddha Gupta and his salutation to the Buddha for safe passage to Bujang Valley. This is an example of a Chandi, a, a Buddhist um, shrine. And when excavated, uh, there would be uh, a relic chamber of the Chandi. So the Chandi was uh, more or less a stupa and that had uh, jewels and relics embedded in it. So the Buddhist project in Indonesia, this was helped especially by uh, the librarian, Yati at uh, the UH library, a Hamilton library. And, um, and, and also we, we found um, and mapped uh, places in Indonesia that are Buddhist related. So this is um, a mountain there, Mount Merapi at Jogjakarta. And again, we have the, the mountain, the shrine, uh, and down to the coast. And this is another map showing at the very top of this map, you can see the mountain and, uh, and it's an active volcano. And Merapi is, is uh, overlooking Borobudur and the city of uh, Jogjakarta. So I asked people uh, before uh, Buddhism, uh, what they would show in terms of a, a minar or a standing stone, a megalith. And so uh, this Javanese showed me a hand gesture, a mudra uh, as a standing post that would be used as a token or a message that, that it was a sacred site. And this uh, mound of rice uh, also is uh, reminiscent of the Menar or the, or the megalithic uh, structure that we find at Borobudur. This happens to be there. And this is the monument from the eighth century to the ninth century. The largest Buddhist monument is based in Java, restored by UNESCO. And on this monument, we can see the Austronesian navigators uh, with outrigger in their stitched um, plank uh, sea craft. And you can see uh, uh, religious people and, and merchants uh, as they navigate uh, with the wind system across uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, a, a French research team uh, rebuilt that, that ship and sailed it across the Indian Ocean to show it would be seaworthy. This is an example in Sri Lanka of the stitched plank uh, hull of the ship. Uh, this is before the tsunami uh, in Sri Lanka where there were many outriggers on the beach and many of them were broken 
due to the tsunami of 09. These are the um, this, uh, these are aspects of the of the of this um, of the, the um, relief. So these show pilgrims. And it shows uh, Islamic um, uh, people coming to to uh, to the site and, and also appreciating the artwork of the of the monument. And this is an interesting. Uh, it's it's against the wall of uh, uh, of a, a mosque. In, in, in Jogjakarta. And if we go to the next slide, uh, you're going to see the Buddha and we're going to, um, you no, know, if we go back one and it should play. If it doesn't play, it's, it's okay, I can explain. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this, this was in Ramadan and it shows, um, although there are Buddhist and Hindu shrines in Jogjakarta and even against the wall of the mosque uh, and during Ramadan, uh, and even though we were visitors there, we were being called in to, uh, uh, to break the fast of, of Ramadan together uh, with the people there at the mosque. This shows, uh, how congenial uh, it happens to be in Indonesia with uh, religious systems. And this shows uh, Indonesia in three time zones and uh, archeological sites being worked on in 2016. So the, the new evidence points to uh, 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 Singaraja in Bali, where Buddhism entered uh, at this northern port in Bali uh, uh, at the first century. And in Sulawesi, it was discovered isolated bronzes and lesser chandi first to ninth centuries. So these are examples of findings there in Sulawesi. And then we, we did a, a GIS mapping of the sites. Go to the next. And uh, these are uh, color-coded points of, of where Buddhist sites we were able to discover using a GIS mapping points. And again, we found the estuary, we found locations of, uh, of sites where they were uh, coming upstream at the river mouth estuaries. So, so this became a, a common denominator of where routes and ports were located. And so these are the color codes uh, of the Buddhist locations we identified. 
an example of a chandi. Uh, and the, the people, local people, they didn't know really, really what it was, or we, we explained that this was actually from the time of Buddhism from the second century to the fifth century. So the Atlas of, of Maritime Buddhism, uh, people ask what, what example can you give of, of the project uh, that is being uh, now presented to the public? So this was unveiled uh, recently in a digital and spatial humanities map visualized 3D exhibition in Hong Kong and Taiwan. So it's the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. Uh, it's about how Buddhism uh, has developed for centuries in South Asia and how it continues to live on today. So at the Buddha Museum in Taiwan at Foguan Shan, uh, it was launched uh, known as the Buddhist Maritime Silk Road, new media art curated by uh, Venerable Ru Chang, Professors Lancaster, Kara Dine and Cha. It will be displayed until uh, 2026. And so this is uh, the poster for the exhibition. And showing uh, the exhibition displays. And we can play this for a few seconds that will show how how you, you enter the exhibition sound of the exhibition. There's the map and the, and the relief of the ship at over the door. And uh, and the traveling monks. And so visitors walk through this three-dimensional display and learn about uh, uh, in terms of how the ocean and uh, Austronesian navigators carried uh, religious uh, systems across the ocean. So far-reaching goals of the projects are to further standards in cardiographic strategies through the utility of digitization, content, and format, giving new possibilities for local and international collaborators. Again, I want to mention that 3D mapping for projects could provide new guidance for developing best practice standards applied to databases giving interactive multimedia utility aspects. This allows uniting the, the context of environmental landscapes with cultural data for making new enhanced possibilities in spatial humanities for scholarly results. Despite the pressures of colonial past to modern present local populations, continue to redefine how to position themselves on personal, communal, ethnic, and national levels in ways that are difficult to categorize in to holistically comprehension. So our focus is on heritage as a cultural resource that uh, defines a people's ethos and facilitates consciousness of a spatial temporal area to communicate with others, uh, thus defining a sense of place. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Blundell. That was very interesting and somewhat panoramic, I must say. Um, you've done a great job of describing some of the projects that you folks have done in the past. Could you tell us a little bit about what your next plans are for this Buddhist Maritime Atlas? 
So I, I want to, um, I did make a mistake in speaking about the tsunami in, in Sri Lanka. Actually, it was not 09, it was in 04 that happened. And so what I did, and in terms of the, the post tsunami between 04 and 09, I made a documentary film on how the ships were constructed by stitching. And I would like to continue uh, about this, uh, making documentaries on, on the preparation of a sea craft, how they're constructed and, uh, and who's constructing them uh, today and how they compare with constructions that were done in the past. That's great. Uh, this is more work that would have something to do with the digital atlas or separate from that? Yes, this, this would be into the atlas. All of this information goes into the uh, maritime atlas uh, as points. For example, mm -hmm. if it's on the coast of Sri Lanka, where I did this documentary film, it would be then a point of uh, reference on the coast and then to show the documentary film at that point. Any questions from our attendees? I see that there are a lot of people here. Oh, Ted Quax, that's fascinating. Thank you. He's uh, from the library. Any other questions from people? I wondered whether, given your facility in Chinese, whether there might be some other Chinese sources that you might consult to add points to the atlas. Um, besides Fa Xian and I Ching, whether there are other possibilities. I know that Charlotte from has been working with much more recent Chinese sources, I think, to look at early modern ports. And I wondered if that was something that interested you just generally. Yes, as an ethnographer, I asked questions. Let's say um, I was at the Museum of Prehistory in Taiwan, in the South uh, East Coast. Mm -hmm. And at that museum, um, I was talking with the curators there and there happened to be uh, someone from the, uh, the local village where the museum was located and, and they are uh, having a, an oral history uh, in their legend that from the uh, third to the fifth century, there were Buddhist monks visiting their villages. And, and they said, and that's verified in Chinese texts. So we can go there and also the Chinese. Uh, so that is among the Puma and they live and they, and before, before they moved to uh, the Southeast of Taiwan, they were in the Southwest of Taiwan at the time, historically. And so they were greeting and uh, receiving Buddhist monks according to their legend. And, um, and so they said, you don't have, have to believe our legends. You can go uh, to Chinese texts where it's verified. <laughs> Great. Oh, here's some more yeah. questions coming in yeah. from Hong Hong Po. Thank you, David, for a fascinating presentation. You mentioned merchant commissioned Austronesian speakers. Who were those merchants? So the merchants came from uh, uh, East India. They were uh, from Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, and uh, and they became Buddhist. Uh, simply because there was no prohibition in terms of sea travel. Whereas uh, if you were under uh, a Brahmin related uh, influenced belief, that you might be restricted for sea travel. But merchants, uh, especially if they became Buddhist or following sects of Hinduism, for example, the Shivites, uh, they would also be released to, uh, to travel by ocean voyaging. So this, this was uh, something that I found and I found it in the monuments and, uh, and the source material and inscriptions. So uh, the question is, what about the Borobudur carvings of ships that mm -hmm. do not appear to continue as actual ships uh, in the modern era? Okay, so these, these ships, outriggers, uh, as I mentioned uh, prior to the tsunami in, in Sri Lanka, uh, were very much 
used in 19th century, uh, they were there were very there were huge large commercial ships outriggers that carried tons of cargo to Sri Lanka and back to Indonesia. So uh, there's historical documentation as well. Sorry, that's from what period? So uh, they, this is uh, at the port of Hambantota in Sri Lanka, and they were uh, uh, transporting uh, goods and services uh, along the coast of India, and they would also travel to uh, Indonesia as well. During what period of time? 19th century. Oh, what another question I have is about um, what's the earliest evidence we have from Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia? I, Himanshu Ray writes a lot about um, Buddhist pilgrims also coming to Southeast Asia, but I wonder from an archaeological perspective whether we have any way to connect these places, whether you have um, perhaps suggestions of Southeast Asians and then Nora Dipura early on. I just don't know anything about that. So the Singaraja uh, temple at the northern uh, coast of uh, Bali mm -hmm. in Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, it is dating from the first century. And, and there are um, sherds of uh, pottery that uh, can be traced back to uh, uh, the east coast of India, uh, also from that time. So, uh, not much earlier than the first century, uh, but if we look at, um, uh, you might say Buddhist uh, influence in the region, it might have come earlier. I know Ian Glover uh, discovered some uh, artifacts uh, that originated from Orissa that were found in Thailand that he claimed dated back uh, 2,300 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, that was found in an estuary in Thailand. So, but these are early historical and they coincide with the advent of Buddhism and, and the trade system, the early trade system. But do you think that, I mean, we have evidence from Eruka Medu, we have the rouletted where shirts you're talking about. Are you, are you saying that we can feel pretty confident that uh, the east coast of India and Sri Lanka were both on the same sort of route to Southeast Asia? Yes. And, and, um, and, and transporting um, out of the east coast of, of this continuum between Sri Lanka and the east coast of India, um, from the harbors we have found uh, early transmission and uh, materials, uh, including shipwrecks that are, uh, are found at the bottom of estuary uh, river mouths and uh, harbors that were, they were transporting large cargo. And so this is, uh, uh, yeah, very early, I, I, at least dating back to the first century. That's really but, interesting because if you look at it from a point of view of statuary, the earliest statuary we have in Southeast Asia, most his, that looks Indic and from South Asia, most historians peg at fourth or fifth century. So this is happening much before then. Yes. And, and then of course, um, Austronesia is, is beginning in the Neolithic era. So, so so the Neolithic navigation also was, was uh, prominent uh, before we have a historical uh, reference to uh, Indic uh, Dharma transmission. And to show you who's a South Asian versus a Southeast Asianist, my question is, who were those merchants? Were the merchants who went from South Asia to Southeast Asia, were they from South Asia? Because most Southeast Asianists believe they were Southeast Asian and hence Austronesian. Or are you saying that some people in South Asia were also Austronesian speakers? Uh, at the ports, uh, they were not Austronesian speakers. Um, for example, in Sri Lanka, there's Malayu as a language that's in the South of, of Sri Lanka mm -hmm. that originated from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the the people of, of South Asia did not speak Austronesian languages. So these uh, many of the merchants of uh, 
Indonesia or Malay origin, they were actually doing most of the trade. So you would agree with Southeast Asianists then that the mariners who were flying the Bay of Bengal, a lot of them were Southeast Asians? Yes, yes, uh, Indonesian and Malay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from other people? This is our last call. We've had some good questions. Be bold. There's maybe another community. Let's see. So uh, last question I think is very interesting because um, I did not show, I have some um, illustrations of, of large uh, outriggers uh, that match the size or larger than ships coming um, from Indonesia that, that are depicted in Borobudur in the eighth or the ninth century. Uh, and then of course they were much earlier and very large uh, ocean going vessels and they extended all the way up through the, the 19th century uh, and, uh, and, and the early colonial times, uh, European colonial ships then replaced uh, those outriggers, large sea going outrigger, perhaps, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, I could ask you many more questions as an archeologist who works on the period, but I, I think we'd better take this uh, to its end. And thank you very much for speaking with us today. I think on behalf of everyone at the University of Hawaii, we, we want to say mahalo. And uh, we hope that we get to talk with you again soon. Yes. Thank you. Mahalo to everyone. Right. Bye-bye, everyone.